I'm Kristen Vengler, and our mission with this podcast is to help you and the people who love you through the shock of diagnosis and treatment. I'm Eva Shea, and the incredible woman whose story you're about to hear is a nurse practitioner in San Francisco who has dedicated her life to caring for patients more vulnerable than you can imagine. Her name is Natasha. This is a story about what happens when you have breast cancer, told in real time. And another podcast that we can definitely start is Dating with Cancer. (laughs) I want to hear about what you're doing. (laughs) So I met this completely amazing person online about three and a half weeks ago that we've kind of been seeing pretty regularly. Is this the unexpected guy, the guy that you went out with? And I said, what are you doing? And you said, well... How many men do I admit to having? I don't know. I just, I just know about the one. (laughs) I don't know. This was a guy I met like three or four weeks ago and we went for dinner and it was just incredibly comfortable and nice. And, you know, we went to see a show this weekend and he made dinner for me, but it's like building on the shit they don't tell you about chemo. It's like, how do you start talking to somebody that you don't know that well about the unexpected things that may or may may not happen if you're actually going to try and date somebody with cancer. Right. And it's, you know, like at the beginning of our conversation, it says, yes, there's no hair down there. (laughs) (laughs) Right. So how awkward is that? Right. You know, and it's like, and I hope this isn't one of the the weeks where I'm suddenly going to start puking for no reason, you know, in his like beautiful designer house. Oh, Um, shit. I told him on like a first or second date, I think I've mentioned a few times, like one of my goals, if I can say I have a goal of of this podcast and of living with cancer in my community is to talk about it, to not make it be a taboo or a this sort of shameful disease that I've got. I mean, and he was very gentle at the beginning. He's like, is it okay if I ask you a few questions? I'm like, well, of course it's okay. Yeah. And we went to a show on Saturday night in Oakland and I ran into a good friend that I haven't seen for a while, but knows that I have cancer and, and also knows my sense of humor. And the friend came up, he's like, oh God, you look awful. Do you have cancer or something? <laughs> Which is the way, but this guy that I've just met was kind of horrified. He's, and I'm like, no, 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 no. I need the cancer jokes. It's like, that's the way I've gone through this and it's perfectly fine. Right. And yes, I am kind of covered in bruises because I think I've got no platelets. That's right. <laughs> oh yeah, absolutely. I'm so happy that you're having fun. Yeah, but it's, you know, it's odd. And it's like, yeah, and next week, my third cycle's on Wednesday. And my second cycle was was very different. It was harder. I was much more tired uh, to a fatigue where one day I was like, my head is not lifting from this pillow. And I, you know, I, I've been sleeping till like noon and one and nausea almost the whole time. Mm-hmm. Um, this low lying nausea with like, you know, I threw up this time, which I hadn't done the first time. Lots of people are like, oh, well, you should know that it's cumulative. I'm like, well, that's it. it's not what my oncologist says. Exactly. They say that the fatigue is cumulative. That's always what I heard. Yeah. Right. So, so far I disagree with that comment because the first and second time couldn't have been more different. Interesting. Because I think that was like the last time we talked was right before the scan. Mm-hmm. And right, I think we talked on um, Monday and Tuesday was the scan. Right. And then Wednesday was your next chemo. Mm-hmm. And so I think we're, you were a little bit surprised at how, not that you breezed through it, but it was kind of yeah, like- but kind of. Not what you had heard and thought. Right. And even the even the infusion itself was, you know, I got really dizzy at one point, asked for some extra anti-nausea meds, which- you know, it's like they give you the tiniest drop in the bucket. It's like, you know, if I was at home, I'm going to take more than 0.5 of Ativan. Like I'm going to take two. Right. But, you know, they give you like this tiniest thing almost where I just want to say, like, save it, put it back in the bottle. It's not worth. But yeah, it felt like my body had a very different reaction, even to the infusion itself. Like afterwards when I was done, like I wasn't ready to like bounce up and go celebrate. It was like, nah, that felt very different. Mm. Did you have the, I remember you said you had the itching before. Did you have that this time? 
Not as badly. No, I changed up some of my medication to stop the itching. It was as if like something was off with my blood pressure. Like if I stood up too soon, I got really dizzy because I'm getting four medications. It's it's a long day and it just felt like an even longer day. And I don't know, I was just ready to be done with it. Whereas in a way, the first one I felt like not excited, but I was like, well, kind of. It's like, yeah, the treatment's begun and you know, we're gonna knock this thing out. And right. And there was definitely like, I had a couple of days this week and I was like, I don't know if I can do four more. And clearly I can, and I'm going to, and it's, as my father says, Natasha, this is not an option. I know like other people, like there are chemos that are way worse than this. I know that, but it was, I just like, there was one day I had, yeah, I had a couple of real poor me days this month. Well, and we're going to talk a little bit later about some other reactions that you had Mm -hmm. that were pretty crappy, so to speak. Yeah, yeah. And we'll come back to that a little bit later. Mm -hmm. But can you take me through when you get there to the end, like what happens again? Because everybody's is a little bit different. Yeah. So I'd love for you to take me through that a little bit. I get my treatment in a huge medical center at the new UCSF Medical Center. And so I always get lost from the minute I get there. It's like, even now it's, So I get there and I have to find where on earth I'm supposed to go for labs. And what they've done to try and help because it's such a huge center is they don't really care about your name. You get this little pet tracker that you clip onto you and they can find you wherever you are in the building. That's kind of cool. So the nurses have this big screen and when they come, it's kind of nice. Like they literally come to you and say, Natasha, it's time for your labs. But you tend to feel like somebody in a, from a, at a deli counter. It's like, I actually have a name rather. I don't need a number. And, and so they do labs and then you sit and wait for the lab results. And in theory, labs happen at eight. And then at nine, I see the oncologist, but nothing goes to plan. Everybody's always late. I'm usually on the wrong floor. And then this time, my oncologist had had actually had a COVID scare. So she was working from home and I can't do the Zoom visits, Zoom doctor visits to me, especially when it's a physical. It's like, you know, I know the lump under my arm has really decreased and I wanted her to verify it for me. And I don't know why I needed to verify it because I know, but I, I felt like a proud child, like, look, mom, the lump went down a bit. And then once I've met with her, then there's more waiting. And then eventually, and I I don't know if it'll happen every time, but they sit me in the same chair. That's really nice. And it's like a, it's much more open plan. The hospital I work at, it's very small rooms and people have much more privacy. But here it's very open plan. There are sort of four of us in a pod. And because I'm doing the Digni caps, it starts with that. So it starts with an awful lot of fussing around with getting the thing on my head. And it feels like anybody who's done like scuba diving, it's that tight. It's a like a scuba hat. And then underneath it has this um, sort of like plastic thing that has channels that hooks up to a freezing water machine. So it's mm-hmm. a little bit like an, an ice machine for anybody who's had knee surgery. Mm-hmm. And then I think they have to pre-freeze my head for 45 minutes before they can start anything. And it's always the first 20 minutes is just, it's awful. Like I have to take Tylenol before I go because I'm going to get a headache. And and then I usually get one of the bouncy nurses, which is <laughs> is a mixed blessing. Honestly, I'd rather they have me with the snarky nurse, but I, I get the young bounce. Oh, this time I'm like, I'm a travel nurse. I'm like, okay, how long have you been doing oncology? Oh, this is my first job. I'm like, oh, this is great. This is great. <laughs> oh, and what I missed out is they've already accessed my port for the labs and they leave a little thing dangling down so they can use that. And one of the things people listening, you need to remember is look at the clothes you're wearing before you go to chemo, especially if you've got a port, because if you have a, a long sweater dress that they can't access the port, you may just literally have to get changed, but they need access to the top six inches of your chest for eight or nine hours. So what do you wear? 
I've actually got a shirt that I like to wear like a kind of a camisole top under and then it's easy to just have the port accessible. But I saw a lady who came in with this beautiful like sort of long sweater dress and they're like, oh, I don't know what we're going to do with this. Like they're pulling the collar down and it's a, you know, it's like San Francisco. So people are wearing, like, wearing fancy stuff and it's like, she's probably got some like $300 cashmere fancy thing that's getting pulled down and it's, right. it was all very awkward. And eventually she went and got changed into a hospital gown. Then they usually start with the pre-meds, which is just a ton of stuff. It's like, here's something to stop you having nausea. It should last three or four days. Here's something else. Here's something else. Here's a bag of saline water that's going to make you want to pee every three hours while you're hooked up to this machine and this hair machine. So strolling to the bathroom with your pole is not that easy because I have to get unhooked from this hair machine and Oh, God. So I have a question for you. Did you notice that when they flush your port or probably when they do that saline, that you taste something? Yes. Tell me yeah. what you taste. I want to know what you taste. So I taste the sea. I taste the ocean because they don't use a lot of heparin. It's mostly just salt water. Okay. Because I remember like, I don't, I've never drank acetone or nail polish remover, but whatever I would imagine it tasting like, that's what it was like every time. I would, I was expecting the saline or the salt water. Oh, wow. Yeah. I'm just curious if everybody's different. Yeah. I don't taste any of the other pre-meds. I think I did talk last time about that weird reaction with the dexamethasone, which makes your... Naughty bits. Your naughty bits. <laughs> burn. Yes. Unbelievable. And just for 30 seconds. And then it starts and they just like, they hang bag after bag of chemo. And it's, I think my first one is taxotere. And then I get the carboplatin, which comes after that. And then there's something happens in the middle, like some change around of tubing. And then I get the two hormonals, the pergetta and the herceptin. And it's a long day. I think last time I was there from about eight till seven. Oh, Natasha. Yeah. Because once that's done, the hair machine has to be stopped and then they have to have a cool down because my hair is literally frozen under there. So do all of those chemo medications, are those all types that are known to cause hair loss? So the second two don't, for sure. The two hormonals don't. The taxotere and the carboplatin are pretty known for their hair loss. Okay. And I felt guilty about being able to afford this hair machine, even though we've praised my dad for paying half of it. Right. But this is an entitled comment. And believe me, I feel all the guilt that goes <laughs> with it. But I do feel happy that my hair's not fallen yeah. out. Well, that's another thing you don't have to deal with, right? When you're feeling shitty is, oh, there's a handful of hair. Cool. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Oh, because my dog ate my wig. My new dog ate the wig. So that's... <laughs> <laughs> no, I came in the bedroom the other day. I'm like, what is that on the floor? I'm like, oh, the new puppy ate my wig. Okay, that's great. <laughs> oh, man. So it allows me to go through the world not getting stared at as a cancer patient. So have you, have you lost any hair with the cold caffeine or? Not yet. No, not, wow. that I've, not that I'm aware of. I mean, I can brush it and none comes out. There's none on the pillow. Great. Yeah. It's interesting because I think my body awareness, like I really don't like the port. I'm still losing weight. I'm not quite sure. Well, I can imagine why because like I just had no interest in food for the past month and there's only so much frozen mac and cheese that I could really get down. And when I was yeah. throwing up, I really wasn't interested. And my port's really obvious because I look so skinny. You can even see the wire. I'm just like, I'm skinny and like knobbly and I hate it. And, you know, it's a different sort of body feel, but I, I avoid mirrors for sure. You know, and getting dressed to go on, on a date when it's like, you know, the opposite of like all my clothes like make me look disgusting. It's like everything's just hanging off. It's like, so you find the tightest, tightest like Uniqlo jeggings that you bought years ago. And it's like, yes, yeah, something that doesn't make me look disgusting. That's so interesting because, and I, I wonder if it has to do with the difference in your HER2 positive and your hormone negatives. Mm-hmm. 
because, you know, a lot of people say it's the steroids, the steroids make you gain weight. And I was listening to a podcast and it was someone who was talking about gaining 40 pounds. And she was also hormone positive, as was I. Mm -hmm. And I think when you and I were talking about some of the side effects that you had, it, it had to do with something you were taking because of the HER2 positive that made you sick. The bed situation. Oh, the bed situation. Yes. Oh my God. No, this is Pergetta, which is, I don't know, it's, that's its brand name and I should look up what its generic is. And this time I had the worst diarrhea that it must be humanly possible. It was as if like my intestines had been rerouted and somebody had connected my bladder to oh. the other orifice because, yeah, I mean, it's like, I didn't know how to deal with it. And then there was the night where I woke up in a pool of my own poop and so I got up and I was just exhausted and I cleaned the place up and I tried to blame the puppy, but she wasn't even there. <laughs> so I cleaned it all up. I was like, Natasha, that was, that was disgusting. I'm super tired, went back to bed. An hour later, it's the same story. I was just like, I can't, like, I wanted to just stay and lie in my poop and just like sleep on the other side of the bed and be like, you know, I'll take care of this in the morning. I, but no, you know, I'm from England. So we clean it up and we do more laundry. And it was just, you know, and then for some reason it just stopped. And there's no, like, I haven't been taking any other, like I was so full of Imodium. I was like beyond the daily dose of Imodium, but there was nothing, you know, as we've talked, Kristen, it's like, you have no way of knowing which of the side effects is going to come when and for what reason. Like I'm close to cycle three. So I thought like all the side effects should have been finished by now, but no. And let me make sure I'm understanding the timeline on this too. This wasn't like it was days after the infusion. No. This is like a couple of weeks after, right? Yeah, because we're yeah. coming up on your third treatment this week. Right. I mean, right? this is what we call our good week. Right. It's, with the three week schedule, you know, usually the first three or four days after the infusion, I'm fine because I've still got all the pre meds. And then it can be like a week where things are just iffy. You don't know which way it's going to go. And then, you know, in my first cycle, the last week and a half was clear. I could have done anything, but no, not this time. It's like I, you know, I get, as they say in Ireland, the wild shites. <laughs> the wild shites. <laughs> yeah. Oh, well, and I think we've talked about, this is literally shit they don't tell you about chemo, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. <laughs> Number 992, right? right? And I, I look at the side effects that just taking me and you as an example, it's been so different. My big, big fear was neuropathy. So far, I haven't had a tingle of anything. Doesn't mean it couldn't happen in the next two minutes because that's the chemo side effects, but you know, it's like, I don't remember anybody talking about diarrhea to that level. Right. I don't know if you got the chemo book or not, but I have the 70 page book of all about chemo and it's partitioned out to here's the most common, mm -hmm. here's the less common, least common, rare. Right. And so I didn't read it all, Right. you know, I'm sure every single side effect that I have, like my freaking chemo toe. I'm sure that's in there somewhere, but I didn't get to that piece. Right. And they don't, there's no rhyme or reason as to who gets what. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's the crapshoot. It's like, nobody can really tell you what it's going to be like. I mean, they can say fatigue and I can think, oh, I've, I've had fatigue until you get the chemo fatigue. And I think that that's been one of the hard things. Cause if you know, the fatigue I had this time was was to a level where I was just staying in bed. Therefore, I'm not eating. Therefore, I'm getting skinnier and bonier. And I'm also not hydrating properly. So there's a way that, you know, I'm sort of causing some of my own nonsense that goes with it. But what are you going to do? Right. And even I had that conversation about exercise, right, is going to make the issues with my feet better. But how do you how do you exercise and move when you feel like crap and every step is painful? Yeah. Like it's a whole catch 22. And so that's where you are too with the fatigue. Yeah. Have you had the situation where people, when you tell them you're having these symptoms and, or these side effects, they're like, oh yeah, it's a chemo thing. 
you know, they're very flippant. It's like, oh no, I am bleeding out my throat. Oh, that's blood vessels broke in your throat because of chemo. What? Mm -hmm. Right? I mean, I do have the situation where they'll tell me about other friends or family members who had it much worse. This is slightly betraying my friends, but because it's only a stage 2A and I might not need a huge surgery, I have friends who refer to this as cancer light. Oh, (laughs) sorry. (laughs) No, I know. Give them to me. (laughs) Or it's also been decaf cancer, (laughs) which is kind of like, it's kind of funny, And they can get away with it because of who it is. But there is that sort of attitude that because I'm not losing my hair and I'm trying to have a relatively normal life, that there's a lot of misunderstanding of what's going on behind the scenes. Like the number of promethazine it took me to be sitting in this restaurant with you right now. Right. But I would prefer that than the sort of the, you know, the dead puppy dog look of like, oh, no. Yeah, completely. Yeah. Yeah. So the last time we talked, you were just going to get the scan. And yeah. so can you remind us about like what led up to that? And then what happened? Because Eva and I were going, have you heard from Natasha? Have you heard from Natasha? We were like, oh my gosh, she's not calling yeah. because something's wrong. <laughs> it took a while to get the results. So when they did, like way back when I was getting all of my early results to determine the treatment plan, one of the scans, they found like a couple of some things in my liver. And they were pretty sure, and I read the first report, pretty sure that it was just sort of benign things that go in the liver. But my oncologist is so thorough that she wasn't happy with radiology saying possibly benign. So she sent me for another full body MRI to, so they could really focus on these whatever this was in the liver. And they've now called it, it's definitely benign. Just like little, I don't know, little cysts or something like that. But yeah, had that actually been small metastasis from the breast (sighs) cancer, I would have been up to a stage four. My treatment plan would have changed completely. They did find something to do with my thyroid, but they're happy enough to leave it. Okay. I guess I am. You said a nodule or something like that? Yeah, a nodule on my thyroid. But, you know, it's this thing, like lots of people have nodules on their thyroids. I'm like, yeah, I'm one in eight of us get breast cancer. So let's not just say, you know, it's like, oh, that lump. Exactly. Yeah. Well, I am so relieved because that's the thing. A lot of people don't realize when there's a scan or something, it's like finding out if you have cancer again, all over again, yeah. every single time. And there's so much anxiety around it. Yeah. I also wish they did more scans because I would love to know, you know, and this is where my brain was tripping this weekend. It's like, it's all very well that I can feel that the lump under my arm has essentially gone, but it's the breast mass that we need to worry about. And nobody could ever feel that. Right. So if they could never feel it it or see it, then maybe it's just massive and nobody knows. Like, So what's next? What's going on next? So next Wednesday is cycle three. So I'll be halfway through. I'm nervous about this one though. I don't know I don't know what the side effects could be coming out from this. Again, like, I don't know. I'm Now I'm like, it could be anything. And it, way back when we started talking, I've mentioned that there was a clinical trial that they were trying to sign me up for that I decided not to do. But one of the things with that was after cycle three, they did an MRI to check that the chemo was working. Mm. And I think I want an MRI to see that it's working just doing six cycles. And then, I mean, you know, the story you can, they come out and say, Oh, I'm sorry. You just went all through that. And that was, that was, didn't do anything. That was a question that I had is, were they able to tell anything about your tumor by the scan? Did they look at anything in those MRIs when you had that body scan? No, just that it existed and how big it was and the size. No, they were, they didn't, they weren't able to tell anything smart. And it's interesting, I was thinking the other day, like bits of tissue have been sent to various places to get various scores of things that I don't really understand. And I haven't had any feedback from that. I should follow up. 
And I think, yes, I have a lot of confidence in my oncologist. I don't have confidence in the system, as it were. I mean, like remembering back to my early days when they're scheduling me for surgery, when I haven't even met, like I haven't even had a PET scan, nor do we even know if it's breast cancer, but I'm meeting a surgeon. So right now you're a third of the way through. We'll be positive on that, right? (laughs) All the mind games we have to play, right? Yep. And then Wednesday, it'll be halfway through. And I actually went online yesterday and booked a reservation in a restaurant that's very hard to get into oh, nice. for my the evening of cycle six. Yay. Which Good is for like you. sometime in like mid-June or something. It's it's okay. a ways away, but it's like it'll yeah. That's that's great. I mean, it, and you know, we know it's not the end of treatment for me, but it's, but it's the end of I hope the tough one. It's a big deal. Yeah. The way the rooms are set up where I get my chemo, it's not conducive to like having chats with other people. Like they're a little bit far away, but Mm -hmm. somehow I always end up with somebody in my pod who's a super chatterbox, which was great. (laughs) Oh, that's good. Yeah. And I had this lady who was talking to me. So she did the penguin caps and how on, you know, it didn't really work that well for her. And, but it was lovely. She was probably in her like early eighties and I did not want to go into like, is this breast cancer coming back in your eighties? Like we didn't go, but she, and her husband was like, your hair looked fine. Like you were just being picky. And oh, I forgot you could have people in there too. Yeah. And I've, I've definitely decided I've still told my friends that COVID won't let them in. Cause I don't want, I really don't want to have to entertain somebody while I'm sitting there. That's another whole topic is the way that of taking care of other people's feelings yeah, during it. And I'm a little ticked that you're feeling like you have to justify your cancer. (laughs) (laughs) For my whole cancer, decaf cancer. (laughs) Yeah, your decaf cancer, like your cancer light. One of my good friends in my women's group, she said, Kristen, I'm joining your club. I got some results back. And it's, she goes, it's nothing like yours. I'm not going through anything like you did. And she ended up having a pretty sizable lumpectomy. And you know, radiation that kicked her ass. Mm. And she kept saying to me, oh, I know it's nothing like yours. And I'm like, no, but this is like still your own personal hell. Like it doesn't necessarily mean because I'm having these other things that my corner of hell is any hotter Mm -hmm. than yours. It's a different situation. And so- And we will all live with the fear of recurrence. Constantly. Yeah. Constantly because I don't feel now like I'm living my best life. Like I'm really not eating that well. I'm exercising because I have a dog, but I'm really not like exercising. I'm not doing anything right now with the thought of like making my body feel better, which is terrible, actually. Mm -hmm. Maybe I am. I don't know. Like I imagined if somebody 10 years ago had said, if you got breast cancer, how would you deal with it? And I'd have like put myself up as one of those like warriors where I would do juicing every day and all the, oh, Peloton and the whole. Whereas actually I'm somebody who lies in bed a lot with a puppy and feels sorry for herself. You know, like two weekends ago, I was literally on my hands and knees in a friend's back garden throwing up because she didn't want cancer throw up in her house because it Uh, might be toxic. Oh, shit. It's very different when, you know, and you're the one handling this stuff. Like you put the hazmat suit on and you do the double check and, you know, you're spiking a bag of like essentially, I don't know if you've ever been in the hospital when it spills by accident. No. It's a huge drama. Like half the unit has to get shut down. I mean, they're putting this in our body. Right. And the protocol for if this bag bursts and spills on the floor, it's like Chernobyl. Oh my God. Yeah. I remember there was on Facebook, there was this woman who asked, do I need to get a separate toilet? Because I was told that on chemo days, it's unhealthy for me to use the same toilet as the people in my household because the poison Mm -hmm. is so toxic. Mm -hmm. But I thought it was, this poor woman felt horrible. Like she was going to poison her entire family. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, there's little things. It's like, you know, this new dog likes to lick me. And that sounds weirder than it is. Like, <laughs> you know, it licks my, and it's like, I don't think she should be that close to me the week after chemo. Agree. Yeah. You know, you see nurses who ever get spilled out on their hands. Holy hell, there's a, you know, it's. I can't yeah. imagine. Yeah. And that's going into my, our veins. No wonder we feel like shit. Oh. And so I feel like you're brave 
first of all, for dating and that you are lucky to have somebody who is there who just loves you for you. I told him at our first dinner date and I think he, I don't honestly remember, I think he said, do you want to talk about it? And I was like, not really. Like, you know, I've talked about it. And so it's sort of this, it gets sort of plays a role in our relationship and yet it sort of doesn't. But Wednesday is interesting because he asked, you know, is there anything I can do? And I said, actually, can you pick me up after treatment on Wednesday? Nice. Because that, you know, the plan of people that are whole fell through and I, you know, they insist on somebody taking, yeah. taking me home. And like, here's, I, I said, just to let you know, like, you're not going to be picking somebody up who's like being wheeled out in a gurney and drooling. It's like, it's just me that you're picking up. <laughs> like, you know, and he's like, is there anything special like I need to do? I'm like, no, no just drive. Get a just, big old bouquet of flowers. Absolutely. And <laughs> maybe a steak. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's lovely. Yeah. I mean, I, I think that's, that's one and you and you were brave enough to meet him online. I'm so dang proud of you. Thank you. Thank you for listening to Breast Cancer Stories. To continue telling this story and helping others, we need your help. All podcasts require resources, and we have a team of people who produce it. There's costs involved and it takes time. If you believe in what we're doing and have the means to support the show, you can make a one-time donation or you can set up a recurring donation in any amount through the PayPal link on our website at breastcancerstoriespodcast.com slash donate. To get the key takeaways from each episode, links to anything we've talked about and promo codes or giveaways from our partners, sign up for our email newsletter. You'll get notes and thoughts from me related to each episode and links to the most useful resources for all the breast cancer things. So if you have chemo brain, you'll be able to just go read your email, find anything we talked about on the podcast without having to remember it. The link to sign up is in your show notes and on the newsletter page at breastcancerstoriespodcast.com. We promise not to annoy you with too many emails. Thanks for listening to Breast Cancer Stories. If you're facing a breast cancer diagnosis and you want to tell your story on the podcast, send an email to hello at theaxis.io. I'm Eva Shea, your host and executive producer. Production support for the show comes from Mary Ellen Clarkson, and our engineer is Daniel Cruiser. Breast Cancer Stories is a production of The Axis, T-H-E-A-X-I-S dot I-O.